Hello, and welcome to Chambersburg Community Theater's virtual radio plays. My name is Kelly Kozlowski, and as CCT's Managing Director, it is my pleasure on behalf of our organization's Board of Directors, casts, and crews to welcome you to this exciting special event. Over the last few weeks, our world has been rocked by the global pandemic of COVID-19. Our daily lives are almost unrecognizable to what they were just a short time ago. Like so many small businesses and nonprofits around the world, CCT has felt the pains that this crisis has left in its wake. Our organization, a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1954, has been forced to postpone two main stage productions, close its office doors, and think outside the box like never before to find ways to keep this 66-year-old grand lady afloat. But now, more than ever, the old adage rings true. The show must go on. So, today we're proud to bring you another theatrical event utilizing the technolo technological mediums that have become a common part of our daily lives. The great William Shakespeare wrote that all the world is a stage. And in that spirit, some of your favorite CCT faces are bringing theater right to your screens. We know that these are unprecedentedly difficult times, but CCT's core mission is now, and has always been, to entertain, educate, and enrich our community through live theater. If you enjoy this evening's performance, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to our organization by visiting our website, at www.cctonline.org slash donate. Every little bit helps. Today, we continue our virtual radio play series with the 1949 radio adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. This classic story which has stood the test of time, focuses on the love between family and the perseverance of the human spirit. In a time when leaning on loved ones is crucial to our physical and mental well being, this story's message is a much needed one. Starring CCT favorites Lynn Brinquist, Joan Crooks, Amaretta Schultz, Zoe Hobbs, Amy Beth Davis, Preston Cook, Logan Connor, Tom Colley. Vicki Gauntz, and Aaron Trusky. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy CCT's virtual performance of Little Women. My little women, my four very precious little women. Sometimes I see them still as they were in those days, dark days for us, trying days, with their father still away in some distant army camp. And yet, even in those days, Christmas came again. And since I was busy at the army hospital, my little women decorated the tree for themselves. Amy, it needs another string of popcorn here. And a few more angels. I'll paint them, Joe. I think it's a beautiful Christmas tree. Well, it's nice, Beth, but... But what, Joe? Well, Meg, Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents. No, it's so dreadful to be poor. Well, I can tell you one thing. We won't always be poor. Someday I'll be a famous writer and make my fortune selling stories. And you'll all ride in fine carriages and have servants and money and dozens of dresses. I should like that. So, there's no use fretting now. Come on, let's rehearse our Christmas play. Amy, I wrote a new scene for you. It's wonderful. Oh, no. It's perfectly simple. All you have to do is shout, Roderigo, Roderigo, save me, and faint. Roderigo, Roderigo, save me, and faint. I can do that. I've planned my costume, too. It's absolutely plain with all the colors of the rainbow in it. Impossible. Why? I'm a princess, am I not? You're a princess, but you don't know it. You think you're a servant girl working for Beth. I mean, Hagar, the witch. 
A princess always knows she's a princess. Well, you don't. Look, Beth has just left the stage with her kettle full of simmering toads. You're locked in the tower. Suddenly, I enter. I'm Hugo, the villain. And you cry out in horror, Roderigo, Roderigo, save me, and faint. Then Roderigo, that's Meg, enters. Meg? Roderigo? I thought Meg was Don Pedro, my father. He is, but you don't know it. Does Meg know? Of course I do. Then I want to know too. Why shouldn't I? Because if you know who you are, the play is over. Well, it's too long anyway. Amy, please. After all, it's my play and... And what? And... Look! Look, you can see him through the window! Who? That boy next door. He's watching us again. Where? Where? I want to see him. I certainly would like to know him. I'd like to know a boy for a change. Show, that's brazen. They say in the village, he's a very wild sort. He ran away from school and they couldn't trace him anywhere. And finally they found him in an army hospital, wounded. How perfectly splendid. I would like to do that. You'd make a wonderful soldier. And now he's staying with his grandfather, Mr. Lawrence. And while he's recovering, he has a tutor. I wonder how I can get to know him. Perhaps our cat might get lost. And he might bring it back. And we might get to talking. I don't think that's very romantic. Nobody said anything about romance. Yoo-hoo! Hello? Joe, you're disgracing us. What will he think? He'll think I'm awful, but he did wave back. There must be some way to get to know them. They always seem to be having so much fun. Perhaps one of these days, or I could- Lori. Oh, hello, Brooke. At the window again? Your grandfather is not going to care much for that. After all, you're supposed to be studying. Studying? Hang it all, Brooke, it's Christmas Eve. That's no excuse. But I have a suggestion. A suggestion? Perhaps if we started your studies earlier, we might finish earlier. Then by four o'clock, you could give your undivided attention to the view. And we'll start this very moment. Look, she's out there now. That's the one I like to watch. See her? Yes, though it's a strange way to spend Christmas Eve, shoveling snow off the walk. She swings that shovel like a boy. Interesting, isn't she? Mm, yes, but the other one is pretty. She must be the oldest. I think, you know, I've been wondering if... She's seen us. She's smiling up at us. Brooke, I'm going to talk to her. Careful, Lori. Your throat. I'm all right. Hello there. Hello. Isn't that hard work for a girl? That's all we have in this family. Why don't you come out and help me? Can't. I have the quimsy. Oh, what a shame. Isn't catching. Uh, I can have visitors, only I don't know anyone. Well, you know me. Almost. Could you come over here and help, uh, help me keep company? I'd be very happy. Brooke, you think she'll really come? I don't know, Lori. I... Marmy! Marmy! I think she'll come. I'm so glad you were able to come and visit. Uh, let me take your coat. Thank you. I've come to entertain you. I will read aloud and you can listen. I do love to read aloud. I'd rather just talk, if you don't mind. I love to talk, too. If you'll come in here, this is the drawing room. Christopher Columbus! What richness! Why, this is a palace! It's marvelous! So roomy! So full of things! I call this splendor. I really do. It's just a room. Uh, will you have some tea? Of course. Sugar? How many lumps? 
One, please. No, two. <laughs> Three. Three it is. Thank you. Well, Mr. Lawrence, now do tell me about yourself. Of course, I know all about your school and the army. Well, in fact, everything. But before that, what? Well, I used to live in Europe with my parents what? and- I'm going to Europe, you know. Really? When? Oh, I don't know exactly. You see, my Aunt March, I just started working for her as a companion, and what a fidgety, nervous soul she is, too. Well, anyway, my aunt has rheumatism, and the doctors thought baths might... <gasps> Cookies? Thank you. Oh, not that she hasn't got a bath. She has a very nice one. Did you take baths while you were there? Baths? I mean, for your rheumatism. I haven't got rheumatism. Neither have I. But you see, I figure baths wouldn't do me any harm. I mean, that is to say, while I was, mm, these cookies are good. Besides, I've always wanted to go to Europe. Not for the baths, of course, not at all. For my writing, it's so good for writers. You see my Aunt March. Oh, but you don't know Aunt March. What were you going to say, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, nothing, except I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm Laurie. Well, Laurie, then. And I'm Joe. That's short for Josephine, of course. Of course. Tell me, how are you getting along with your grandfather, Laurie? Oh, uh, fine, once I got used to him. You know, he's, well, he's... Uh... Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> I suppose we shouldn't even dare say it in front of his portrait does look grim, doesn't he? I can see how his face might frighten a lot of people, but I can't imagine being afraid of him. Of course, every time I've seen him, he's been barking at something, but somehow, well, I rather like him. Uh, thank you, ma'am. <gasps> oh! Grandfather! So, you think my face frightens people, young lady? Yes, sir. Frankly, I do. You understand, I don't think you mean to frighten them, but your face. Well, you asked me, sir, and, and yes, I do think so. And I bark, do I? I have heard you bark, yes, sir. Perhaps you don't bark all the time, but you do bark, yes, sir. But with all that, you rather like me, do you? Yes, sir, I do, in spite of everything. And I like you. Will you have a cup of tea? Thank you, I had one. I was just going. Wait a minute, I'll walk home with you, Joe. No, no, you stay indoors, young man. But grandfather- I should be enchanted to see Miss March home myself. Shall we go, my dear? Thank you. Goodbye, Laurie. Goodbye. Laurie, did she come? Laurie, what happened? You won't believe it, Brooke. A miracle. Yes, it was a miracle. Our home, that for so many months had known only the voices of my little women, now frequently echoed to men's voices, too. Mr. Lawrence was suddenly quite neighborly, and Laurie was a constant visitor. Brooke came with him, too, as a rule. It wasn't hard to see why. The way he and Meg smiled at each other made me happy and a little sad. Young Laurie smiled at Joe the same way. But months went by and she gave him no encouragement. Joe was busy, you see. She was writing. And yet, tis whispered that when the gondolas glide through the fatal waters, these same waters still run crimson with the blood of Lady Viella and her gallant lover, slain by the phantom hand. The end. <sighs> Joe? Oh, yes, Beth. Come in. You're crying. What's the matter? My story. Oh, poor Joe. Is it that bad? It's wonderful. Oh, well, Lori's waiting for you. Oh, Bilge. I told him not to bother me. He says he's going to wait until you come down. Let him. I wish he'd realize I haven't the time for his nonsense. But he's waiting, Joe. What'll I tell him? Tell him I went up in smoke. You aren't really, are you? 
Oh, my darling. But I am simply not coming down. And the sooner Mr. Lawrence understands that. No, Beth. What is it, Meg? Oh, it's dreadful, Joe. A telegram from the army. Father. He's in the hospital in Washington. Marnie's leaving at once. You'd better come down. There. I think I'm packed now. Mr. Brooke, if you'll carry the suitcase out. I'll be glad to, Mrs. March. I'll help you, Brooke. I do wish Joe would come back. She's been gone since... Oh. That must be Joe. She always slams the door. Joe, is that you? We're here in the... Nonsense. Can't you see it's not Joe? Aunt March. Well, where's that bad-tempered daughter of yours? I thought she was with you. Well, she isn't. Here, take this envelope. You'll need more than you asked for. There will be other expenses besides your train fare. Thank you, Aunt March, but why didn't Joe bring it? Because we had words, that's why. As always, she was rude and impolite. She ran out before I could ever even... <sighs> there she is, in here, Joe! I've been running, so I... Aunt March. Yes, miss. I had to get dressed and ride all the way over here just because you were so obstinate. But well, Aunt March. I, I am not interested in explanations. Good day. Joe, where have you been? Yes, we were worried. Well, Aunt March croaked as she always does and I lost my temper. So I decided to get some money on my own. Here, Marmy, this will pay for your fare. Thirty dollars? Where did you get it? I didn't beg, borrow, or steal. I only sold what belonged to me. What? Well, if I take my bonnet off... Your hair! Your beautiful hair! Oh, my Joe! Your beautiful, beautiful hair! Now, don't wail, Beth. It doesn't affect the fate of the nation. Really, I like it short. Christopher Columbus, you look like a porcupine. Really? Well, I feel deliciously light and cool. But, Joe, uh... Laurie, dear, her hair will grow back, and it'll be as lovely as ever. But, Laurie, she'll never be more beautiful than she is now. Mrs. March, you'd better come along. Mr. Lawrence has the carriage outside. Yes. Yes, I'm coming. Amy, Beth, Joe, take care of things. Goodbye, my darlings. Goodbye, Marmy. Goodbye. Goodbye, Marmy. Goodbye. Don't cry, Joe. Father will be all right. I'm not crying for Father Beth. What then? My hair! Dear gallant Joe, the bravest of my little women, the one who loved us most, dear Joe, who could dream a thousand new stories and never see the ending of our own. I was sitting in my room that day, their father had been home for a week, and at last I'd gotten back to my sewing. She burst into the room like a hurricane, and when I looked up, startled, Mommy, do something. Go downstairs quick. Brooke is kissing Meg, and Mommy, she likes it. Joe? Joe? Yes, Laurie? I saw you leave the wedding and come outside. I, th I thought perhaps you wouldn't mind if I came out too. No, I don't mind. Don't feel badly, Joe. E even if Meg is married, you know, you've still got me, of course. I'm not good for much, but I'll stand by you all the days of my life. I know you will. You don't know what a comfort you are to me, Laurie. Joe, will you listen to what I want to tell you? No, Laurie. No, don't say it. Don't. I, I will, and you must hear me. It's no use, Joe. We've got to have it out, and the sooner the better. 
All right. Say what you like, then. I'll listen. I have loved you ever since I've known you, Joe. I couldn't help it. I've tried to show you, but you wouldn't let me. Now I'm going to make you hear and give me an answer. Laurie, Laurie, I wanted to save you this. I never wanted you to care for me so. I know I'm not half good enough for you, Joe, but, well, if you love me, you can make me anything you like. I wouldn't change you, Laurie. I wouldn't change you at all. Then, Joe, please. Oh, Laurie, I'm so sorry. So desperately sorry. But I can't say that I love you when I don't. Really and truly, Joe? Really and truly, Laurie. I don't think I'll ever marry. Yes, you will. I know you will. You'll meet some good-for-nothing, no-account fool, and you'll fall in love. And you'll work and live and die for him. I know you will, because it's just your way. And I'll have to stand by and see it. Well, I'll be hanged if I do. Laurie, where are you going? To the devil. Laurie didn't go to the devil. He went to Europe instead. And when Aunt March went over the following month, my Jo was faced with her first great problem, whether to go to Europe with Aunt March or to go to New York, as I promised her, to live and work and write in her spare time. She chose New York. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I dropped my book. I, I, I'm the new governess. I'm Josephine March. Do you live here too? Yeah. My name is Friedrich Baer. They call me Professor. I too teach. How splendid! But, of course, that isn't all I do. I'm really a writer. A professional one. So? Oh, yes. But I do wish you hadn't stopped playing. It was so beautiful. What is it? Oh, it is a song, really. The words are by Goethe. Nur wer die Sheskut Kind. Do you understand German? No, I don't. Then I will try to say them for you in English. Uh, let me see now. Nur wer die Sheskut Kind. Only who knows what longing is. Wies was ich leidi. Can know what I suffer. Aline, alone, and parted far from joy and gladness. My senses fail, a burning fire devours me. My senses fail, a burning fire devours me. Oh, if only I could write something like that. Something that would set other hearts on fire. You truly like to write, then? Oh, yes. Writing is my life. I've scribbled ever since I was a child. Some of my stories have been published, and I just sold another to the Weekly Volcano. The Weekly Volcano? You, you must forgive my ignorance, but uh, what is that? Why, it's a magazine, of course. Oh, you see, one can always learn. Yes, indeed. That's why I came to New York, to see and hear and learn. So perhaps we can be a bit of help to each other. I mean, well, since we are both to be living here anyway, perhaps you can teach me about magazines, and I can teach you about music. Yes? Oh, yes. I think that would be wonderful. And Marmy, you have no idea of how exciting these months have been. Of course, Amy is learning a good deal in Europe, but I doubt if she has such a teacher as I have. Professor Baer continues to be ever so kind. One week he takes me to the theater and another to the opera, and it's all so wonderful. Sometimes I feel I've known him all my life when really it hasn't been quite a year. Of course, that's because we talk so much, at least I talk. I'm sure that by now he knows every one of you through me. Meg and Amy and Beth and you and Father and even Laurie. Only 
he's always so quiet when I talk of Laurie. But I am running out of things to tell him, so you had better send me some news. Your letter says that Beth isn't well. I'm sure it will prove to be nothing serious. Be sure to keep me informed about her. Write me often. I miss you so much. With all I have here, I miss you dreadfully. Miss Josephine? Yes, Professor Bear. May I come in? Uh, I want to talk to you. Uh, I, I read your latest story in the volcano, as I promised. Oh, did you like it? Miss Josephine, I must be honest with you. I was disappointed. Oh. Why do you write such artificial characters, such contrived plots? The Duke's vengeance, villains, murderers, fainting women. <laughs> oh, Miss Josephine, please. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't want to hurt you. It is you. It has nothing to do with you. I had a letter. You've had bad news. And then a stupid professor comes blundering and makes things worse. No, I want the truth. If I can't stand the truth, I'm not worth anything. Please. Well, first I say to myself, maybe I have no right to speak. But then I say, I maybe have no right to be silent. Because she has talent. You really think so? Otherwise, I would not say it. You know that. And I say to you, even sweep mud in the street before you are false to that talent. Only say to yourself, I will never write one single line which I have not felt first in my own heart. You will do that, my little friend? I'll try. You will write about this simple, beautiful things you know. The things I know, the things I've seen all my life. I'm going home. Home? You are leaving us? That's why I was crying. It was in the letter. My family needs me. Beth is sick. Beth was very sick. We lost her the week after Joe came home. Those were sad, dark months for me. My heart was heavy for the one who had gone, and heavier still for the one who remained. My Joe was so changed, so quiet now. Day after day, she closed her door on us, and I could hear the scratching of her pen as she wrote. It was though she lived only for her work, nothing else, even when I told her the news from Europe. Oh, but Marmy, that's wonderful. Lori and Amy, why, they were meant for each other. Really, I couldn't be happier. And a few months from now, when they come back, as man and wife? Joe, are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong, Marmy. All that matters now is my writing. In fact, I'm off to the post office this very moment. The post office? To mail my novel. It's finished. I'm sending it off. You can read it when it comes back. Maybe it won't come back. Maybe they'll publish it, Joe. Oh, I'm not sending it to a publisher. I'm sending it to Professor Bear. Professor Bear? Why? Because I promised him. Amy, you look simply wonderful. Europe and marriage both agree with you, I think. Now, tell me all about... Joe, dear. Is something for you? Well, how nice. Thank you, Laurie. Oh, it isn't from me. Then what? Open it, Joe. Don't just look at it. I can't imagine. Why, it's a book. My Beth by Josephine March. Joe, it's your book. They published it. How wonderful. Lori, who left this with you? A, a man. He had sort of an accent. Where is he? He wouldn't come in. He went away. Oh, no. He couldn't have. He couldn't have. 
Joe, where are you going? Joe? Professor Bear! Professor Bear, wait! I don't understand. You were going away without even seeing me? I, I didn't want to intrude. You have guests. Just my family, and they want to meet you. No, no, please. You see, I, I think that... We're having sort of a party. My sister Amy just got back from Europe. She's married to that boy I told you about, and... To... to that lorry. Yes, that's the one. So, you see... But... but I always thought that you and he... Uh... You couldn't have. I told you. Yes. Yes, you told me. It's the first time we've been together in ages. So you have to come in and meet uh, Please, please, just a minute before. That is, I have something to say to you. I mean, would you... Oh, I have no right to think you will, but there I hope that you and I... I know I should not ask. You are so lovely and young and so alive. I have so little to give you. Nothing but my heart, which is so full and these empty hands. They won't be empty if I put my hands in them. Josephine. Josephine. Shall we go and join our family? Thank you all so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's performance. If you did, please consider making a donation to Chambersburg Community Theater. You can donate by visiting our website at www.cctonline.org slash donate. Please join us for our next performance. And in the meantime, please stay safe. Please stay healthy. And until next time, we'll see you on the radio.